sounds great. Um, anyway, thanks for your patience. Um, and thanks for being here. Thanks for, um, um, you know, still having the patience to listen to me at 3.45 p.m. I'll try to keep it as lively as possible. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So today we are going to talk about open sourcing financial services. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but the reality is uh, that's not the case anymore. And uh, I'd love to walk you through a little bit of our history and how we got here. And most importantly, why we're seeing uh, what I'm hoping can be defined as a renaissance of open source in financial services. So I'm Gabriele Columbra, I'm the Executive Director of Finas, the FinTech Open Source Foundation. We are the umbrella foundation under the Linux Foundation uh, for financial services. We joined about a year ago. Um, this is the first time I see many of my colleagues in person, and this is my first talk after a long time, so forgive me if I'm a little rusty. I, uh, not sure what's the protocol anymore to look at people in their eyes, shake hands, and stuff like that. Um, with Finos, we have uh, uh, almost 50 members, uh, uh, and most importantly, over 50 projects, uh, standard projects, software projects, and special interest groups. Um, apart from being a you know pretty logo slide, uh, I'm you know very proud to have. Uh, uh, in our foundation, and of course members of the Linux Foundation, uh, um, financial institutions, uh, increasingly retail banks, uh, uh, software vendor, fintech vendors, hopefully more and more, and uh, of course also our associate members. Uh, we are seeing a lot of power in helping existing consortia in the industry to embrace open source in the very same way we've done with individual institutions. Um, but as I said, you know, as an open source foundation, we uh, uh, are focused on building projects and valuable projects, hopefully for the industry and beyond. And so we're pretty happy to have now over 50 projects in our foundation. Um, if you want to learn more, you probably are familiar with the concept of landscape in the Linux Foundation. So if you go to landscape.finos.org, uh, you can have a look at the over 50 projects and special interest groups that we discussed. Um, what we are experiencing, especially in the last two years, has been uh, a pretty outstanding growth, uh, not only in terms of members, uh, but in terms of projects. Uh, um, we're now past 50 and especially in terms of contributors, which is you know, pretty unprecedented if you think about um, you know, contributions from banks and financial institutions have been pretty sparse, to say the least, in the, in the last few decades. And so we have now reached, uh, over time, over 1,000 contributors. Uh, and what I hope to walk you through today is really how we go here and what are the macro trends that we're seeing in the industry that are uh, motivating such a contribution. Um, before I go there, though, I think it's particularly uh, important to understand that our contributions are largely coming from financial institutions. And that, again, I think it's uh, uh, something that is very new. Uh, until even ourselves as a foundation, when we started in 2018, the very core of the contributions will come from vendors, will come from technology vendors, which are, of course, uh, you know, way more familiar with open source and open source contribution in particular. Uh, in 2020, uh, eight out of 10 top contributors to Finos come from you know, pretty well-known financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Citi, Deutsche Bank. And um, again, this is what makes us think that open source and open source contribution is here to stay in the industry. Um, but it hasn't always been the case. Um, just need to go back uh, you know, eight years uh, to find articles like this one uh, being uh, pretty much the norm. Um, you know, some people would not trust open source. Some people would flat out say in this industry they hate open source. Um, now, you know, I think it's fair to say that, apart from sort of cultural reasons, um, open source was considered too big of a risk. Um, and it's still, in large part, uh, in large parts of the industry, still considered too big of a risk. Um, this is, again, an article from 
nine years ago. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this case, but there was a big uh, uh, lawsuit between Goldman Sachs and one of their developers uh, that actually so allegedly stole code and uploaded it to a subversion repository. Now, the defense was on the other side that uh, this was largely open source code that was taken uh, from the high frequency, platform, high frequency trading platform of Goldman Sachs. But this was a big sort of moment in the industry that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, associated open source to this notion of risk, to this notion of, again, even more than what culturally the industry had already, um, you know, as a very highly competitive industry, as a very regulated industry, um, you know, this was one of those sort of uh, objections that was generally uh, uh, brought up when, uh, especially early in the days, we were discussing about open source contribution. But then somewhere, I would say, uh, middle of the last decade, uh, 2014, 2015, uh, things started to shift. Um, kind of bringing back an example on Goldman Sachs. Um, on the left side, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the platform called SecDB, um, the securities database. Uh, that's basically a platform that uh, is used throughout Goldman Sachs to represent securities and providing you know, uh, uh, API access to basically the whole firm uh, on, again, instruments that they trade. Well, this platform was widely regarded, that's the article on the left in 2013, was widely regarded as Goldman Sachs secret sauce. What was their competitive differentiator with respect to other firms that had a much more fragmented representation of their securities. Now, if you only fast forward four years, same publication, same platform, um, that was starting to be seen as a, as a weakness. Um, why is that? Well, fundamentally, this is a fully proprietary platform uh, based actually on a language that is an internal language called slang for which there exists no talent out there. And so on one hand, you know, the lack of talent in maintaining and evolving that platform was considered a weakness, but beyond that, other competitive institutions started building their own single dealer platforms on open source languages like Python, for example. Um, and if you pair that with the vast ecosystem of uh, AI and ML libraries that is built every day by the open source community on Python, well then it's pretty clear how in just four years, uh, uh, the very same secret sauce was starting to be regarded as a, as a liability in the industry, as a as a potential weakness moving forward. And so we've seen the industry starting dipping their toes in uh, open source. And to be clear here, the industry has always consumed open source. Um, they might tell you that they didn't, uh, which actually opens up a whole different <laughs> conversation on compliance and, and regulation, but uh, what never happened, or at least never happened to the extent that we're seeing it today, was open source contribution. Um, and so I would say mid last decade, uh, we've seen, for example, the AMQP project open sourced by JP Morgan with the help of, of our friends at Red Hat. Uh, um, we've seen Open Mama, actually a project under the Linux Foundation who is now uh, under Finos being open sourced by, again, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and, and several of these firms. Um, we've even seen examples of collaboration or creating foundations around open source that you know, haven't been necessarily successful. The, the article on the top right, you don't see the name there, but it's an effort called Lodestone, um, which was really an effort between uh, Deutsche Bank and HSBC to try and open source um, really the basically capital markets uh, uh, infrastructure, the sort of the basics of the capital market infrastructure um, in a way that they would basically disintermediate some of the vendors that are very much incumbent in the industry. Uh, unfortunately, that approach didn't really work well. It wasn't set up as well as the Linux Foundation <laughs> sets up uh, uh, governance and structure around sort of a truly level playing field. Um, but it was at least an attempt and an understanding that uh, open source could be uh, really a sort of a, um, 
a counterbalance for an industry that is very much uh, dominated by, by incumbents. Um, and then I'm particularly familiar with the example on, on bottom left. Uh, the Symphony Software Foundation, in fact, is the predecessor of Finas. Uh, it's the foundation that uh, you know, I had the honor to, to start running in December 2015. Um, and that was actually you know, a fair attempt at creating a chat collaboration platform uh, that would uh, be you know, uh, um, providing basically an infrastructure for banks and buy side and the sell side to um, really trade. And you know, very much the business is now based on chat. You know, what, if you think about the exchanges, uh, uh, you know, that is not necessarily how it happens anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of you know, communications that happens over different media. Chat is really the backbone. You know, most of it happens on Bloomberg. Uh, and so 12 institutions kind of joined together to create an open source alternative to Bloomberg. Now, Let's say that there were some good things around the Symphony Software Foundation, including creating the trust and the awareness that a foundation, a neutral third party, was needed to um, really disintermediate an industry that, again, is very, very um, culturally competitive, culturally risk averse. Um, and so, you know, uh, we think that's really the beginning of what we're seeing right now in terms of. Uh, active contribution from financial institutions. Uh, I want to stop for a second uh, to analyze some of the trends and, and the reasons why we're seeing uh, beyond sort of uh, uh, the talent uh, aspect that we discussed, why are we seeing uh, financial institutions uh, you know, taking the leap into open source? Well, uh, first of all, um, if you're familiar with how the industry has been going the last 10 years, now 12 years since the you know, uh, crisis in 2008, certainly the margins have been shrinking, both in terms of the top line. Um, uh, I don't have my presenter notes in front of me, but over the last 10 years, uh, the revenue of the top 12 investment banks went down, I don't remember what was the number, but it's basically like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs disappeared uh, in terms of how much the revenue is you know, being threatened by, you know, of course, uh, ETFs and other uh, you know, uh, electronic trading instruments. On the flip side, the bottom line, um, you know, after Dodd-Frank and the regulation in 2009, uh, there has been a huge amount of uh, spend, increased spend, probably I think 30, 40 percent growth uh, in terms of the regu regulatory spend of these institutions. And so, there's simply not as much money to throw at technology problems as there used to be 10, 15 years ago. And so I think this is one fundamental aspect as to why we're seeing firms looking for more and more efficient ways of innovating uh, uh, in their technology organizations. Um, the second you know, undeniable factor is what you would refer to as the democratization of the industry, uh, which is still you know, at the very beginning, but if you pair the, the fintech wave and the amount of investment that is going into uh, you know, smaller, vertically focused, customer-centric focused uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ventures, as well as the decentralized uh, uh, ecosystem. You know, we have our sister foundation, Hyperledger, who has really made a huge impact into the growth of that ecosystem. Um, well, then, you know, that clearly clearly threatens the very definition of what it means to be a financial institution. And so while, of course, there's been a lot of reluctance to embrace uh, uh, this world, there's also the clear awareness that you know, something has to change in the way uh, these institutions run their business and, of course, run their technology stacks. And, of course, number three, um, I think it's, it's pretty obvious by now, most of financial institutions consider themselves technology companies or want to be technology companies. Um, you know, I think there's still a fair uh, road uh, ahead there, but they are undeniably very technology centric. This is a pretty much fully digital business at this point. Um, and so, you know, the move to cloud 
all of the organizations are going through cloud. The fight for talent between East Coast and West Coast. I mean, there is this interesting hate and love relationship between the East Coast and the West Coast, whereby on one hand, you know, banks are angry at the West Coast for sort of uh, stealing their business, but on the other hand, they keep on trying to imitate them and, uh, um, you know, taking executives on a daily basis from Amazon, Google, Microsoft. And so, um, you know, whether this is, uh, um, yeah, definitely I'm not saying that this is a, a process that is complete, but it's certainly a process that is driving a more and more mind share. And, you know, open source in my mind is one of the sort of least kept secrets of the West Coast in terms of how they continue gaining, um, you know, a competitive advantage with respect to financial institutions. And so, um, in 2018, based on what we had created through the Symphony Software Foundation, uh, you know, first and foremost, the trust among these financial institutions, um, we realized that there was, uh, the timing was right to launch uh, a, an entity that became Finos, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, that would really become the steward for open source collaboration in financial services. Um, now, let alone that it's not a platform, it's a foundation, but that's what you got, you know, from press, and you're gonna take it since it's on Forbes. Um, and, and that was really the beginning of, you know, what we know today as Finos. I'm not gonna go through the, the whole history. Uh, I think you guys have endured enough presentations today, so I'm not gonna go through the whole busy slide here, but um, what I want to highlight around the history is we started really with 12 major financial institutions with the goal of uh, enabling them to do open source. And so in the first couple of years, uh, contributions were mostly from vendors. The banks were simply not ready to uh, contribute to open source. I mean, I don't know how many of you work in financial institutions, but a developer at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan could not access GitHub in 2018. Um, it's almost like when I was a consultant and I couldn't access Google uh, at my customers. It's like, it was pretty much, you know, useless. Um, then in 2000, so the first two years were really about enabling open source readiness, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that in, in the next slides. But what really changed uh, with the major switch happened in 2020, and, you know, uh, I think you probably heard this line before, but you know the pandemic has provided some degree of digital acceleration uh, to this industry. Um, you know certain trends that were already started, as we saw uh, earlier in this decade, definitely accelerated, including, for example, I can now use Zoom in my meetings with banks, um, which was, you know. I had to use WebEx for several years. Again, nothing against WebEx, but it's, it's good to be able to sort of adopt new technologies. And I think in the same way banks got more comfortable with uh, remote working, you know, we were very well positioned as you know, a naturally distributed community um, to show them how it's possible to be productive in a technology organization while working in a completely distributed remote way. And so in 2020, we started seeing this uptick of contributions from uh, uh, institutions that frankly hadn't done much of that before. Uh, we've seen Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, and Citi contributing years and years of intellectual property. Uh, and not only so, starting to work in an open source first way. And I'm gonna come back to that as to, to what that means. Um, now, before we go into a couple of these examples, a couple of these projects that, that we have the, the honor to host in Finos, uh, I just wanna, uh, you know, kinda manage expectations here. Um, this year, in partnership with the fantastic uh, team at the Linux Foundation Research and some of our partners, we pro GitHub and ScottLogic, we've ran our inaugural uh, State of Open Sourcing Financial Services survey. Um, we really want to create a baseline in terms of where the industry stands. I mean, of course, we have qualitative information having been in there for a while now, but it's always, you know, I'm a, I'm a number guy, I'm a data guy, and uh, 
we want to create a baseline as to where the industry is when it comes to consumption, contribution, culture, and just really readiness of the industry to collaborate uh, in the open. Um, the reason why I bring this up here, and I'll show you a couple of slides, is uh, um, yes, there is clearly a, a much uh, stronger realization of what the benefits of open source are for the industry. Uh, we'll talk about those. But we're still far away and certainly lagging other industries when it comes to uh, policy, when it comes to the corporate structure and the uh, really ownership of open source uh, uh, within these organizations. Uh, and this is not surprising, but I guess it's really good to have hard data on it that we can work and improve over the next years. Um, particularly, I think, again, this is something that just a few years ago, having had to sort of pitch to several of these institutions, uh, it wasn't well understood uh, that you know, innovation, um, time to market, reduced total cost of ownership, uh, talent retention, were top motivators for any technology-centric company to really engage in open source. And now, you know, if you look at this data, again, this is a sneak peek to a survey that is going to be released next week. Um, you know, over, you know, 75, 80% of the respondents of this survey, and this was over 300 respondents, so a pretty good sample across the industry, do understand the value of open source. And again, that's, that's a big thing from when we were even five years ago where open source was mostly considered a risk. And the industry is starting to structure for it. Uh, I know this might be a little small to read, but um, this is showing how many of our respondents had uh, consumption, uh, have policies within their organization for consuming open source. And among, you know, sort of different degrees of, of, of uh, um, completion, completeness, you know, over 70% over of the respondents have a policy for consumption. Um, again, this is something that uh, even a few years ago was probably um, not as clear. Um, when it comes to having an OSPO, um, not surprisingly, uh, the industry still, you know, probably only one of three respondents has a formal OSPO. That said, I have personally seen five to ten large institutions this year hiring uh, an open source program office lead or, you know, uh, to a certain degree, you know, not extremely senior, but quite senior, per, quite senior organization, sort of uh, quite senior uh, leader uh, to structure their open source program. And so, again, in terms of managing expectations, there's still a long way to go. Uh, um, several of uh, uh, our respondents, I would say still the majority, still see you know, a fear of lacking intellectual property, uh, legal or licensing concerns, uh, um, clear lack of, of ROI uh, uh, as, a, as a, you know, reasons for not fully enabling uh, you know, an open, a firm-wide uh, open source contribution policy. And so, again, I think this reinforces very much the work we've been doing over the last few years, shameless plug here, around open source readiness. Um, we're super excited to have five plus financial institutions actively contributing to the foundation. On the other hand, there's still a long tail of institutions, as we've just discussed, that still either don't uh, value open source, uh, you know, the strategic value that we think it should have in, in such technology-centric companies, still don't have, you know, internal policies, uh, or still sort of live of a culture, a cultural background that is still very much brisk averse, and that is still very much, um, you know, uh, siloed. And so uh, we continue to run Infinos uh, now in partnership with the Linux Foundation, with the To Do Group, and the several other initiatives around this area that exist in the LF ecosystem, what we call our open source readiness program. Um, we're really working to get banks to the place they should be. Uh, to be able to contribute to open source. And with the realization that there is something particular about this industry when it comes to regulatory requirements, regulatory concerns, before they're ready to sort of prime time. Um, 
Now, the, the reason why we continue investing in open source readiness is really because we have seen firms uh, gain more and more value from open source as they increase their open source maturity. So unsurprisingly, when we started, most of our projects were very much focused on the technology organization. Uh, for the values, uh, for the sort of value proposition that you probably are very familiar with, whether it is you know, talent acquisition or retention, whether it is you know, efficiency through mutualization of common uh, uh, um, technology, whether it is de-risking the investment on a commercial open source vendor. Um, and so, you know, the earlier projects and some of our special interest groups continue to evolve in that direction. Uh, open source readiness, DevOps mutualization, cloud service certification, inner source. There's a lot of sort of practice uh, that I think uh, we think in this institution it's still lagging what you know, probably you guys are used to and the open source community at large is used to. But especially over the last two years, we have seen that those firms who have a much clearer understanding of uh, the strategic value of open source and have at least started the journey of structuring uh, their internal organizations to be able to allow developers <laughs> to not only consume but contribute to open source projects, uh, are now realizing that there is power in open source collaboration beyond code, uh, driven directly by business needs, uh, whether it is uh, a faster interaction with their clients uh, and a better, more efficient interaction with their clients, I'm thinking banks and, and wealth management, uh, whether it is a better collaboration with regulators, uh, um, a big part, uh, a big initiative for us is what we call Open Rec Tech. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, whether it is, again, just collaborating with their peers uh, uh, in sort of on common industry challenges, even basic data standardization, uh, it's been a huge issue. If you think about it, this is an industry that by nature needs to interact with each other. You know, they're, they're trading on the same instruments and they need to report to the regulators sort of on common requirements. So it's an industry that at least in principle has a lot to gain uh, through open source. And then finally, again, this is probably, I will count <laughs> the firms uh, uh, on, on sort of one hand probably, but we are seeing some of those really starting to see open source as a strategic pillar of their technology strategy. Um, and in a way becoming more and more akin to financial, sorry, to technology organizations, to, to big tech. Um, we're seeing more and more platforms being rolled out, and I'm a personal believer that you know platform goes very well hand in hand with open source. Um, you know, open APIs, open standards, SDKs for your developers that you know you want to maximize usage of, and therefore open source really works well as a companion if you're trying to sort of do a platform play. Um, so. Once again, another validation of why we continue to invest in open source maturity of this industry. Now, um, the last 10, 15 minutes, just a quick uh, uh, overview of you know, how we do this and some of the key projects that we've seen these banks collaborating on. Um, this is pretty similar to, you know, uh, uh, I think any foundation under DLF. Um, we have infrastructure, we have a very structured and, and you know, proven to be successful uh, software and standards governance. Uh, we talked about our open source readiness initiative. And then you know, I think one uh, kind of derealization is that we need to do maybe a little bit more work uh, ourselves as a team than in more mature open source communities. And so you know, together with our member success, really trying to make our member realize the value of open source, we have a lot of focus on project success. We're probably, again, a bit more hands-on than, for example, you know, uh, a Linux kernel development community as a team. Um, now, I want to show you a couple of the projects um, that, that we've received over the last years. Uh, very much all the projects that you see here, minus one, have been contributed by financial institutions. Um, perspective, 
uh, was contributed by JP Morgan in 2019. Waltz was contributed by Deutsche Bank in 2020. Legend, it's our biggest project, contributed by Goldman Sachs this year, sorry, last year. Morfir comes from Morgan Stanley. Uh, 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 again, last year, 2020. Cloud service certification is JP Morgan. FDC3 is the one project that was contributed by a vendor, but is now used by several financial institutions. And again, Plexus, Deutsche Bank. So again, just to show, um, we think that there is power in end user driven uh, uh, open source communities. And we continue to invest in fostering banks to open source intellectual property and to hopefully sort of build on each other's achievements. Um, I want to touch quickly on Legend, which is by far the largest project that we have. Um, this is a logical modeling, visual logical modeling platform, um, open sourced by Goldman Sachs in 2020. Um, it has an underlying language. It has a visual editor. And not only have we seen other financial institutions now adopting it and using it internally, um, but we as a foundation are actually hosting this platform and we are inviting uh, business folks to directly collaborate in the open. And so kind of going back to the technology organization and the business uh, level value, it's not only about your typical mutualization of open source, say yes, Goldman Sachs has open source this platform, by the way, deployed on Maven Central, on Docker Hub. Um, you know, this is open first. Goldman Sachs, this is not a dump and run, um, to be clear. Uh, uh, Goldman Sachs deleted their branches internally, so they're really consuming from the open, and we're seeing contributions now coming from other institutions. But I think the interesting bit is we've also seen, by the means of hosting it in Finos, um, we have been able to invite business folks to collaborate directly on the platform with the output of the collaboration being a data model, a standardized data model that can be used across the organizations and potentially can be used with regulators for their regulatory reporting. And in fact, that's why we're also investing in our relationship with regulators. So I think this is a really powerful platform. I'd love for you to try it. Again, you don't even have to download it. If you go to legend.finos.org uh, slash studio, uh, we'd be happy to provision access to it, as long as you have a CLA. Um, the other um, project, kind of going on the other end of the spectrum, uh, uh, a standard project, FDC3 stands for Financial Desktop Collaboration and Connectivity Consortium. I realize it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but it was, if you're familiar with how traders work, um, with their like five screens and 50 applications running, well, this is the standard that is trying to create a common connective tissue for these apps to interoperate with each other and interoperate with the underlying desktop environment that they're running on. Um, it was originally open sourced by a vendor, and now we are working to have financial institutions define what the use cases are for you know, the next version of the standard. Once again, very much end user driven. Um, I think a testament to it is that I'm actually able to show those logos out there. <laughs> it's not that easy to get a logo from financial institutions, even though if they're, they're all using them, but you know, having them on the record and being able to, to uh, uh, promote the fact that they've been using it, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, I think City has uh, come to one of our meetings telling us that they use it for about 900 applications internally. So pretty uh, uh, mature and uh, we hope valuable uh, project moving forward. Um, we talked about ROI quickly before and, and some concerns that there are still in the industry around ROI. Um, Perspective is a, a, a real-time visualization library open sourced by JP Morgan, over a thousand starts on GitHub, so truly you know, open source project. Um, these are the numbers that were shared by one of our Platinum members uh, about two years ago in terms of the you know, uh, savings and efficiency and ROI that they got by using this uh, software. Now, 
I realize it's a pretty you know, high level, it's a pretty rough set of metrics. Uh, you know, we could spend probably a whole other hour session on, on discussing the ROI of open source, uh, but I think it's pretty powerful, again, to see a financial institution, uh, which shall rename unnamed, uh, um, sharing the you know, over $3 million savings that they had by using this, this um, library. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time, or at least some time, for questions uh, in terms of our special interest groups. Uh, but again, this is a concept that actually we didn't have until we joined the Linux Foundation. We realized that uh, there is room for basically coalescing common interests in our foundation, um, whereby you know, maybe certain organizations are not ready to contribute code or to work directly on an open source project, but they certainly have common challenges, whether it comes to, again, open source readiness or uh, mutualizing or conjugating the notion of DevOps in a regulated industry, uh, or working together on common regulatory implementation. Uh, the hope is, of course, that the special interest groups will spawn off into actual open source projects and open standards, not just remain, you know, talking uh, groups. Uh, but that's really, uh, you know, something that we launched October last year, and we've had already five being started and being pretty lively. Um, the one that I am personally uh, most excited about is our open rec tech. Now, in principle, mutualizing open source regulation, you know, seems like an obvious concept, meaning when we collaborate in the open, we collaborate on areas where the requirements are common across multiple parties, and, you know, regulation sort of tick that box. Uh, we typically collaborate on areas where, um, you know, there could be some cost savings by collaborating, and, you know, as we discussed before, the cost of regulation, regulatory implementation for these institutions has become huge over the last years. Think about MIFID too. Um, so where we started was really to try and enable banks to mutualize uh, regulatory implementations. Now, there is the hope that maybe when my grandkids grow up, uh, we could have also the regulators themselves produce machine-readable, open-source regulation. But again, I want to manage expectations here. I might have to wait for, for my grandkid to grow. That said, we've had really good engagement from regulators. Um, like, the financial like financial institutions, they are also on a spectrum. Uh, I'm not saying the spectrum, on a spectrum of maturity when it comes to, to open-source. Um, you know, some are really familiar, some they have their own GitHub organizations, some others, you know, we had to restart the conversation from, you know, what is a computer? Um, and, uh, um, but this is an area where we expect to uh, continue investing in the next uh, years, and we see a lot of potential to really become indispensable in the industry. One of the projects that is really related to you know, to mutualizing uh, regulation is our uh, cloud service certification project. Uh, the goal is to really have uh, uh, a truly open source framework for proving compliance to financial regulation when it comes to cloud deployments. Uh, we are working on a partnership with another organization called CDMC, Cloud Data Management Capability. Uh, uh, but in the meanwhile, I exhort you to take a look at our cloud service certification project. We have JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and several vendors already working on it. Again, with the idea of this is a journey that every financial institution is undergoing, and there's no reason why each institution should be doing their own uh, financial regulation implementation when it comes to cloud. Uh, and we certainly could, get, could uh, use the help of technologists who are uh, very familiar uh, from tech companies with these issues and have clearly invested in interest there. Um, now, just to, as I, as I wrap, uh, there's much more uh, to open sourcing financial services. In Finos, we've had one new project contributed every month this year. Uh, but, you know, admittedly, there's much more than this. Uh, only this year, we've seen, I don't know if you're familiar with Move, 
It's an open source, uh, uh, basically embedded finance platform, truly open source with the building blocks being completely open. Um, I just came across two weeks ago to um, Gain Stonk Terminal. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's an alternative to uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, that really came out of the frenzy of, you know, GameStop uh, uh, and the sort of, again, democratization of, of uh, the retail investors. Um, so it's a really lively space, and we think that there's a major opportunity in open so at the crossroads of open source and fintech. Um, so looking forward, and hopefully I can leave a couple of minutes for questions. Um, these are our themes for next year. Um, we continue to enable these firms to become tech companies, leapfrog into tech com companies if they need be, uh, cloud and open source readiness, and this, finally, the developer centricity that we're seeing uh, you know, in the industry. I have to say I've had the luck of always working in open source, and when five years ago you know, I understood how certain, you know, the developer experience of certain developers within some institutions you know, I took it, I took it personally. <laughs> I took it at heart. I think there is a liberatory aspect to open source in the industry. Um, ecosystem interoperability, you know, API and data standards. We talked about legend that continues to be a cornerstone for us and in the way we work with regulators and certainly uh, the business of open source. We're seeing more and more business driven initiatives. Ultimately open source, it's a collaboration model that goes way beyond code. Uh, and I think we're finally sort of cracking that nut when it comes to uh, financial services. Um, because ultimately, whether you are a financial institution, whether you're a tech or a fintech vendor, whether you're a regulator or an individual, we think there are clear advantages from, you know, for you and ultimately for the ecosystem. Open sourcing financial services is a positive sum game. I'm gonna skip the build here and just do a final shameless plug. Uh, we are back in person. This is my first conference, as I said, after a year and a half, so forgive me if I was a little rusty. Um, but our conference, the Open Source Strategy Forum, powered by the Linux Foundation, is coming back in person. Not sure you're gonna be able to be in London next week. Uh, I will, um, or in New York hopefully in a month from now. Uh, but this is the sole conference for open sourcing financial services. Uh, and I'm so excited to get back to seeing our community in person. Uh, OpenSourceStrategyForum.org, I hope to see you there. And with that, I am done. Is there any question? I know I spoke a lot and we're at the end of the day, so I won't be offended. Got the guy back there. So you listed uh, sort of the maturity levels for different companies and the call walk run sort of level yep. approach. Is there something about the companies at that run top level stage that is fundamentally different? Like culturally? Are they are they, are they cultivated or like in ergo can you as an organization help move them through that stack or do they have to be in a different way? That's a really good question. Um, I would say there are as I said, two or three companies that I can think are already in that stage. And I think it's a combination of, one, they're generally a little bit more nimble than some others. Um, for example, well, I would just, let's just be kosher here, but they are generally smaller than some of the bigger ones. Um, especially some of those are, you know, for example, just investment banking versus investment banking plus retail. And when they are, you know, even when you are talking, say, 20,000 people versus 100,000 people, makes a big difference in the way they can move. Um, I think, secondly, uh, they have embraced this process much earlier than others, maybe 10, 15 years ago. I do think that open source readiness and what we've done, you know, helped but it cannot be the sole driver. Um, I think there is an executive leadership that, you know, has a much clearer idea of why open source, at least from my perspective, stands pretty much like cloud, should be a technology pillar for their sort of overall technology strategy. That would be, so I think size, executive 
leadership and just to an extent culture. Uh, uh, sort of the executive leadership enables the culture to have evolved faster, let's say. Any other question? Please. Yep. It's a really good, really good question. I would say um, um, when we started <laughs> about five years ago, um, I constantly got questions from developers saying, please help us to talk with our lawyers. Please, they just talk a different language. Can you help us sort of mediate the conversation that, you know, I mean, five years ago, I mean, still, but five years ago, you know, GPL was, was not a, a word that you could say in any of these conversations. Now, you know, it still sort of raises some, some hair or some feathers, but rough some feathers, but it, it, it's, you can have an open, mature conversation about licenses without everyone sort of freaking out with the hair on fire and leaving the room. But, so I would say it started developer-driven. It started sort of bottoms up. Um, two or three years ago, even five maybe, talent, like the, the quest for talent, and just the, you know, you, I don't have infinite amount of money to throw technology problems, really helped the conversation with executives. So it was developers, I think then we gained support of the executives, the hardest part still remains the frozen middle. Like those 20 layers in between maybe the individual developers and the executive, whereby the, uh, the skew between sort of cost benefit or risk and reward, it's still very much skewed towards sort of being risk averse. Like why would I risk to put this piece of code out there when I don't have yet a direct incentive you know, from my boss or, you know, uh, uh, sort of a, a, a company mandate to do so. Um, so that, that I would say, still originally driven by the technology organization, developer first, executives, and now we're trying to tackle sort of the frozen middle more from the business side of the house because that has to sort of fundamentally change their, their incentive model. Does that make sense? Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I would love also Daniela's opinion here from, from Hyperledger, but I, I would say it's still, it's still a hate and love relationship from where I sit, meaning there is this sort of curiosity and understanding that they can just ignore this whole movement, whether it is you know, the fintech, broadly the fintech movement, uh, or you know, even further sort of the decentralized DLT crypto space. But at least from my perspective, it's been really hard to see them like taking a substantial leap into, um, you know, bringing those technologies into production. There's pilots right and left, especially when it comes to DLT. There's investments in several fintech companies. I think they still see it more as a sort of a VC uh, backed or VC type activity where they invest in different companies. But I don't know that I have seen um, sort of a full strategy to, you know, how do we evolve our business into that or how do we prevent, um, you know, us from being run out of business? I, I, you know, again, there's plenty of attempts. Um, 
you know, one of my, my grievances, especially with, with FinTech, maybe less with, with DLT, is I have the fear that we're moving from a centralized mess to a decentralized mess. Like, you know, right now we have a centralized mess of, uh, uh, you know, heavily siloed, you know, stacks where, you know, each one has his own ledger and each one has to reconcile at the end of the day and there's clearing and the settlement and, you know, maybe because I'm, I'm used to instant payments in, in Europe, I kind of still get a little <clears throat> uh, peeved by needing to wait 72 hours to send money here uh, in the US to someone. Um, but, you know, I also see all these sort of very vertically focused fintechs coming up with their own, you know, they're perfect on one specific use case, but there's no data standards, there's no common APIs, there's no, so we're kind of moving, you know, to a different scenario, which ultimately I'm not sure if it's going to be uh, incredibly better unless, I hope, open source and open standards can sort of bring it together. So I think to your question, the jury's still out from my perspective, whether they are more you know, trying to stop that movement or whether they're trying to, I think in the last couple of years I've seen much more sort of positive signs of integrating and evolving their business. I think one final point is, it's, for what I've learned, is much easier for them to adopt these new technologies on a new use case versus ripping off a legacy of 20, 30 years where, again, it might just be no worth it might be very risky to, to you know, change a, a completely sort of established business process and organization. Uh, and so the, I think where there is potential is on really new use cases and new uh, regulatory requirements and, you know, something that is net new, then I see a lot of potential to, to sort of work through a fintech or work through DLT and, and you know, hopefully evolve incrementally if that makes sense. Ah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think I think there are one of the areas where we are investing a lot is open reg tech because I think regulation and regulators have to play a key role in innovating the industry and not just sort of you know. Uh, potentially slowing down change. Um, especially, I'm less familiar with Asia. We have less uh, Asia members, although I know they're doing amazing work, you know, especially with the Monetary Authority of, Singa Authority of Singapore uh, in the payment space. Again, I think uh, there are better qualified folks than me to speak to that. Uh, but when it comes to Europe and the US, I think, you know, for better and for worse, um, European regulators are a bit more empowered to impose change. Again, whether it's, it, it comes, of course, with, with uh, you know, other side effects, but I do think that having international standards uh, that apply to everyone does indeed help this process. And so I, I think in the U.S. it's still very much left to, you know, the private sector to innovate. And sometimes the incentives of the private sector, you know, might not always uh, be fully aligned with sort of macro uh, systemic improvement. Um, and so, again, I think it's, uh, you know, we're getting into uh, sort of political conversations here ultimately, but, but I do think that there is an advantage, um, you know, maybe because I'm European, as you can hear from my accent, but there is an advantage of, you know, having uh, the regulators that can help setting standards, and hopefully we can do, you know, implement them, you know, in the open so that they don't become too much of a burden. Ultimately, there is a third way between regulation and deregulation, and we hope open source regulation is that. Any final questions? I'm, I'm getting a, 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 <laughs> a nagging, so I think, thank you. I have one comment. Please, Daniela. Yep. 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 You're welcome. It's very inspirational to see a firm like that come forward. 
Yes. Yes. That is amazing. Thank you, Daniela. I really appreciate the feedback. Thank you, everyone.